This is Sean Walter, CEO of the Investments and Wealth Institute. I'm proud to welcome you to season three of the Exceptional Advisor podcast series. The Institute is committed to the advancement of exceptional advisors. We hope this series helps you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. I serve as the editor of the Institute's Retirement Management Journal and the editor of The Street's Retirement Daily. Today, our topic is retirement risks, and our guest is Anna Rappaport. Anna is an internationally recognized expert on the impact of change on retirement systems and workforce issues. Following a 28-year career with Mercer Human Resource Consulting, Anna established her own firm specializing in strategies for better retirement systems. In addition, she has chaired the Society of Actuaries Committee on Post-Retirement Needs and Risks for 15 years and has played a major role in the development of a recognized research program devoted to better understanding and management of post-retirement risks. She's also a member of the Retirement Management Journal's Editorial Advisory Board. So welcome to the podcast, Anna. Thank you, Bob. Pleasure to have you on. Now, for the benefit of those folks who may be listening and may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us a brief overview? Uh, Sure. I'm Anna Rappaport. Uh, I'm an actuary and a phased retiree, and I chair the Society of Actuaries Committee on Post-Retirement Needs and Risks and the Steering Committee on the Aging and Retirement Initiative. Uh, My work is very heavily focused on understanding the post-retirement period and what the public thinks about it. I think it's a very valuable set of work for advisors because sometimes what the public thinks is not what the advisors think the public should think. Uh, And I think it would be quite helpful for advisors to know about some of our work. Mm. So I've been a big fan of the SOA's uh, retirement research for a long time. I've I've quoted for now years, it seems, the retirement risk chart that you published oh so long ago. And uh, and I think there's uh, a lot that you've published over the years that you've been involved with the SOA uh, as chair of the Post-Retirement Risk Committee. So, but maybe you could talk a, a bit about the research that the SOA has conducted on public knowledge and attitudes about retirement risk and and uh, and what the implications are for advisors with respect to your findings. Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, Society of Actuaries has been conducting surveys every two years, the retirement risk surveys. Now this, we're on the 10th one this year. So for 20 years about what the public knows and how the public feels about post-retirement risk. In addition to that, in 2018, they did a new survey on what the generations think about issues. And we also did some work on 85 and over. I think each of these offers some very interesting insights uh, for advisors, and in a lot of ways, some of these insights are little like little hills to climb, because uh, there are things that the pub, things about what the public doesn't really know, and things to deal with that would help the advisor do a better job. Hmm. So, uh, where to, where to dive in first? Uh, do you want to talk about some of the common uh, threads and themes in in some of the results in in your the risk survey series and perhaps uh, some of the results from the focus groups and interviews that have been done as part of that research. Sure. Yes. And Bob mentioned focus groups. Uh, in addition to the risk surveys and informing the risk surveys, we've done focus groups with people who were relatively recently retired and those retired 15 years or more, and also uh, the work on 85 and over. I'd say the first common thread, and the one that defines some of those little hills for advisors to climb over, is that there are significant gaps in knowledge and planning. There are a lot of things that people don't know, so it's really important not to assume too much knowledge. Um, I'd say one of the first gaps that strikes me as a big problem, and one that advisors could certainly help with, is that a lot of people may not plan at all, but then of those who do plan, they tend to plan for a relatively short time horizon. They'll underestimate life expectancy, and they're they're just not focused on many of the issues. Um, Something that struck us really 
big uh, when we did um, some of the focus groups with recent retirees was when people were talking about their planning, they talked about doing a cash flow analysis and being like, well, if I can pay my bills for the next couple of years, I thought I could pay my bills now and I'll be all right. <laughs> and then we asked them, well, how are you planning to spend your assets down? Are you, would you, are you interested in annuities? Are you interested in a spend down? They were like, well, I want to hold on to my assets. And that led us to this uh, a sort of deep sigh of, oh my God, I wonder how this will all work out. But uh, some of that thinking really says that there's a need to, to go back to basics. Hmm. So in in the research, you talk about the differences between pre-retirees expectations versus retiree experience and expectations in several areas with respect to retirement ages, expectations about working in retirement, sources of income you just sort of alluded to, and then difference in the level of concern about the risk that people might face in retirement, uh, pre-retiree to retiree. You, know, you want to dive into that a little bit? I would, uh, because I think this is a really important issue. Um, we found pretty consistently the things we heard from pre-retirees and the things we were hearing from retirees in the same survey, the two show that there's a big difference between what's actually happened to the retirees and what people expected. And I think that's, again, an opportunity for advisors to help build better expectations, but also help people prepare for the reality versus what they think might happen. Uh, a huge issue is this question of retirement ages. And pretty consistently, in the last few surveys, including 2019, the uh, pre-retirees tell us that they expect to work to a median age of 65, but the retirees have retired at a median age of 60. That's a difference of five years. It's a huge difference. And of course, if people retire five years earlier than they expected, even if they were on a good track to saving for retirement, they probably won't have enough money. And they really need a plan B because some of our other research has shown that an awful lot of people are pushed into retirement and it's not because, oh, I'm ready and I'm ready to meet my dreams. It's something happens and they get pushed into retirement. So I think working with people about not just saving enough to that hope for retirement age, but what are the plan Bs? What about earlier? What are you gonna do? Is that, uh, and sort of in line with that, a lot of people have expectations about continuing to work in retirement and gradually uh, reducing their work, but fewer people are able to realize that. And advisors may be, help, may be able to help them have a plan where they have a better chance of realizing that, as well as um, being somewhat realistic about it. Um, and I think that raises a business question for advisors as well, when you're talking about things like working in retirement. For people, that could be a really important issue as well as retirement ages, but what are the questions that the advisor is gonna help them deal with and what are the issues and as they stray away from investments, uh, does the advisor want to be there? How are they going to be paid? So lots of interesting questions. Mm -hmm. uh, sources of income, this is an interesting issue for years. Um, pretty much an awful lot of the retirees, um, it's, except when you get into the higher income and the higher asset level people, for an awful lot of Americans, Social Security is their main and sometimes only form of retirement income. The pre-retirees tend to underestimate how important social security will be. The pre-retirees also tend to overestimate how much they're gonna get from other sources of income, uh, savings, so forth. And we've, that's been found repeatedly over the years. That's a good place for retirees to be. And this sort of intertwines with the retirement age issue as well. Because for people that are only going to have or have Social Security as their main form of guaranteed income, if they can claim later, they get significantly higher monthly income. And the decision for 
middle Americans and lower income Americans, the decision about social security claiming has a huge impact on their retirement, uh, on, on how successful they'll be in, and the value of their benefits. And of course, to some extent, it depends on how long they'll live, what they actually get, but also this affects spousal benefits. So a big advisor question, I think, is how much are they gonna help them evaluate that decision and how is it gonna be framed? What tools are gonna be used for that? Mm. Um, the, the last point that um, Bob mentioned, which is another place where we find a difference between what we hear from pre-retirees pretty consistently versus retirees, is that the pre-retirees tend to be more concerned about the risks. And it seems that once people are retired and used to things, we're not really sure why, but the levels of concern drop. We've also found that the levels of concern drop um, as people get further into retirement. Now, I'd like to say though for advisors that those levels of concern concern us because sometimes people are under concern. So I think that's another opportunity for advisors, an, a risk area where there's a particularly big problem from my point of view uh, mm -hmm. is long-term care risk. People are pretty aware of the long-term care problem, but very relatively few people have planned for it. It's much more what we found is that they're, well, I'll take care of it when it happens. and Families are often very involved in the caregiving and in helping, but research that we did shows that neither neither side of that equation, uh, the family the family that did the caregiving or the person getting the care was doing much to prepare for the, to plan for that. It just happened. The 2017 risk survey, um, there's a special report on Long -term, there are two, actually two reports on long-term care, one about funding and one about the caregiver. And those reports, all of these reports are available in the Society of Actuaries website, uh, and they're available to the public. But there's just this tremendous gap in knowledge about how to prepare or about preparing and tremendous opportunity to help people do more to prepare. Right. I think in some of your research, you, that one of the differences in expectations also had to do with uh, two other risks that probably advisors are maybe more familiar with in terms of managing. One would be inflation, and then perhaps more recently, people, advisors getting a better understanding of the cost of healthcare and retirement, and maybe trying to help people either set aside money to pay for that or identify the sources of income that would pay for healthcare, or at least expected. Uh, healthcare costs in retirement, maybe maybe less so with respect to unexpected healthcare costs. Uh, Bob, the uh, the top three risks that people say they're concerned about in our surveys are just as you mentioned, inflation, cost of healthcare, and long term care, and that's been pretty consistently through true every two years. The order changes. True for retirees. True for. Uh, True for retirees, true for pre-retirees, and the pre-retirees are pretty much more concerned. Uh, in terms of uh, the impact of inflation, the economic risks, I think we advisors are probably working a lot with that, with their clients on the investment side. But even though as the investment environment changes, it may not be an easy thing to do, they're working with it. Uh, there's also the question of working with them that about that on the spending side. Uh, the cost of health care is a major concern. One of the things that has puzzled me for a long time is people have a lot of health coverage once they're 65 through Medicare, and only about 10% of the population has uh, long-term care insurance. But why are people not more concerned about long-term care versus health care? But it's it's pretty close about that um, work that the Society of Actuaries has done uh, in the last year. Um, we just recently updated a decision brief on health care, buying health care and retirement. And while it sounds really pretty easy um, that 
healthcare and that you have Medicare, there are not a lot of decisions to make. That's really not so true. It even with Medicare, there are a lot of decisions to be made, the decisions that need to be made every year. And I think that's an opportunity for advisors to help their clients uh, with it. And they might say, well, you know, again, it's how difficult is it? But as we worked on the decision brief and told different people told stories, it can be quite tricky. There's also another decision brief about protecting against long-term care that has just been updated. Both of those are available on the Society of Actuaries website. The long-term care new one is available now and the healthcare one is either available now or would, will be available very shortly. Mm. Um, you mentioned that um, the people are their, their planning horizons are too short, short, and that they're it's common that they underestimate longevity. Um, the SOA has built a resource to help I think clients and and advisors uh, address that in terms of presenting um, statistical data around what their life expectancy may be. Do you, you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, the uh, the actuaries have developed the Actuaries Longevity Illustrator. And the Actuaries Longevity Illustrator is a tool that's available uh, free of charge to the public. Uh, and it works for a couple uh, or an individual. It asks a few questions about people's own situation, like their health. So it's tailored to that person. And then it provides a series of charts and graphs that the advisor can use to help them understand longevity. Uh, now, there's a, a kind of a leap. So I think that would be a very good tool for advisors to use. That's a tool that does not recommend any particular product or any particular, so it, it doesn't take you to a particular product or solution. Of course, in terms of dealing with longevity, you have the question of making your money last. Uh, and uh, are you going to, if you have assets, are you going to uh, do some kind of a drawdown? Are you going to buy an annuity? You're going to do some of both. If you could delay Social Security, that could be viewed in a way as like buying an annuity at a very favorable price. Um, then you have the health insurance, long term care questions, and you have other issues in terms of so longe helping people deal with longevity is a complex issue. But the first piece of that, which is the question about the, the planning horizon, is that when we ask people in the focus groups, and I, I recommend in the 2013 and 2015 focus groups, read the quotes that those focus group reports are there, and, and some of them will make you go like, oh my God. Um, but the, the quotes people, they, uh, some people retire, made the decision to retire without doing any calculations at all. But a lot of people do calculations and they look at their regular bills. And when I say they look at their regular bills, um, for example, medical expenses, the premiums that they pay every month are regular bills. But if they have a dental bill, that's not the regular bill in the same way. Uh, if they live in an apartment, they pay rent. but they own a house, they might have to fix the roof, but the fixing the roof, they don't think about. It. So one of the issues that surfaced in our research for advisors to deal with too is helping the people to understand their expenses and that the regular bills is part of it, but if you own a house, you're going to have to fix things. And especially if it's an older house, you're gonna to have to fix more things. Uh, if you live in a condominium, you may have special assessments. Um, you may have high dental bills. Um, there, there's just a variety of different expenses that people may expect or not expect. We did, uh, after the 2013 focus groups, in the 2015 focus groups and, res and the risk survey, we focused on shocks or unexpected expenses. Mm -hmm. And we were really surprised when we, when we heard from people what shocks they had experienced because they're telling us about fixing their roofs and about dental bills. And, you know, and we're thinking about shocks more in terms of uh, somebody got really sick, uh, a disability, uh, death, of some kind of a major problem 
not something that we viewed as a kind of a normal thing that was kind of expensive. Right. But the three sh that would also turn out in the shocks work was that people told us that they could cope pretty well with a number of shocks, um, but three things that they really couldn't cope with, which is a, it's again, these are things for advisors to help people think about. One was a major long-term care event. Mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty, that's pretty universal. If I have a major long-term care event that needs paid long-term care, uh, it, unless they have a lot of money, it's it, it's very costly and it's, it's a problem. And eventually the people, will likely end up spending down their assets and end up on Medicaid. But that's that's long-term care is a big issue. The second issue was divorce after retirement, which splits assets. Mm. And if you have a client that's in any way in that situation, they need, of course, a lot of help. That's a, a The third one is a planning issue that I think is very often ignored. And we've done subsequent work on this. And that was family members that need a lot of help and family members that need a lot of recurring help people said also that they couldn't do that we also heard in the focus that they that was a real problem for them we also heard in the focus groups and then we've done subsequent work people do help their families and i think they'll help their families um even when they probably can't afford it and the parents financially more so than the children uh there's other work that from the health and retirement study that shows that there are a lot more transfers from adult parents to children and grandchildren than there are financial transfers the other way. Mm -hmm. And I've also heard from a planner that an issue was parents giving too much money to their adult children that they can't really afford. So I think that's really an issue for planners and potential opportunity. Uh, to think about the other thing we found out about the shocks from that research another thing was that while people dealt fairly well with one much less well with two much less well with three so that as they multiplied uh, it was much more of a problem so a lot of interesting issues uh, relative to shocks and to planning for things other than just uh, purely longevity the family issues long-term care and health care Mm. Um, did uh, your work is also focused on uh, age 85 with respect to this um, uh, findings as as you think about the journey through retirement uh, are there things that happen to folks who are age 85 and older with respect to uh, to the risks and what they what advisors need to think about with that that age clientele well I think one of the things that that I would say about the age 85 research Linking it back together to the focus groups for people less than 10 years retired and 15 years or more is that we saw a pretty interesting flow through retirement. Uh, one of the things that we definitely saw is that um, the sort of traditional expectations about spending, uh, you know, people will basically stay at their stay at their same um, style of living that they were when they retired maybe spend about the same amount of money and it'll gradually increase for inflation when you look at at household spending by uh, age that's not true at all when you hear what people talk to them. the people were resilient through all of these things they were frugal mm -hmm. uh, they seemed quite fine with cutting back expenses the one area where spending tended to go up was health care. And of course, it varies an awful lot by household. But the spending patterns didn't fit in to what we would expect. I would say the big find, a big, huge finding from the 85 and over was that people needed a lot of help. And the first source of help was from the families. Um, we also found some in terms of help some really interesting things we did some at when we first started our work we did some preliminary interviews with people who had gone to um, long-term care uh, to um, assisted living facilities and what we heard about those people was that generally 
somebody was taking over their finances on a day-to-day -day basis. Most often they're adult children if they have adult children. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a very big issue for advisors to help people with is kind of what is that, what is that plan? Is it gonna be the adult children if there are adult children? Uh, is it gonna be somebody else who helping them find somebody? I think that's a huge issue. Uh, other work that we are doing now, focusing on this, is that it, te it might tend to be the adult child that lives most closely nearby, but that might not be the adult child that's well qualified to do it or most well qualified to do it. And unfortunately, when family helps too, sometimes that results in financial exploitation. So you have to be careful about that. So that's a big issue. But we found a lot of family help with the, not the people that had gone to assisted living, but in general, a lot of people needed help being driven, help with their household. We did two surveys after we did in-depth interviews. One survey by telephone of people over age 85, the people themselves, and overall, they would feel healthier than the population at large because they can hear and they can talk. And then we did a survey of adult children, and we found in both cases, family was doing, and the adult children survey, they had to be people that were really familiar with the, uh, with what the family doing. Uh, we found that the family was helping a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And their, the first, the telephone survey, most of those people were still independent. Some of them were living with children. Uh, the um, adult children, it was, it was more mixed, um, but an awful lot of role of family and help. Uh, one big finding too is that cognitive decline, when it occurs, kind of changes everything. Right. And people's situations vary a great deal. Um, we found in the 85 and over group that most of the people were spending less than their income, um, including we split those results out between people with less than 50,000 of assets and people with over 50,000 of financial assets beyond uh, their pensions and social security. And in both cases, they were still spending less than their income. Um, I just, I'm going to just cite you a, a couple of numbers about the help. Of the survey of the adult, the telephone survey of the adults, uh, the the biggest thing was the need to be driven, mm -hmm. and the um, second thing was support of the residents and assistance with shopping. Down the list was housekeeping, and relatively few of those people, uh, less than ten percent, needed help with activities of daily living, which was completely opposite from the survey of the adult children. But for the survey of adult children, it was also interesting that family were predominant help for things like transportation and shopping. When you got down to medication, management of medications and medical care, it kind of split with uh, more paid help mm -hmm. and cleaning of residents, much more paid help. So that was all uh, pretty interesting. There's a lot of issues also in the 85 and over group with helping them manage their medical care so a lot of issues there yeah so you've done research um amazingly where you've used have surveyed attitudes and concerns across five generations and uh and that work too can be found on the soa.org website um but do you mind uh, addressing some of the uh, the major uh, generate general findings sure i i'd be happy to now i'd like to distinguish the the work I talked about before the, on the, the older people, uh, we've been doing that, that survey for 20 years. This uh, the survey across the generations was the first time in 2018, but we are going to repeat it. And we, the five generations, uh, we had uh, the boomers were split between early and late boomers, and then there's the, the silence after them. Mm -hmm. And then we had millennials and Gen X. Uh, and the first thing I'd say is that overall, the generations had a lot of important similarities and differences with regard to financial issues, and overall, more similarities than differences. Uh, the good news for people that are concerned about retirement is that all of those generations 
said they recognize the importance of retirement savings, and those who have access to a retirement plan at work said they were very likely to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was a little bit wondering about just people really said they participated, were, were some of them may, may not telling us the truth. Um, but the other side of this, and this is a huge issue for, I think, for any advisor, many people across the generations did not have an adequate emergency fund. And this is such a critical issue. And it seems like it would be almost a, a day one thing. You need an emergency fund. Hmm. Uh, one of the things we did in the generations research is we looked at financial fragility and we issued a special report on fragility. We found that the most financially fragile had common concerns across the generations and emergency fund and paying day-to-day -day bills and some of those kinds of things are debt are a big issue. Oh, and we we did relatively little about debt when we looked at the retirees. We did a lot more about debt when we looked across the generations. Um, the next thing is that all of the generations feel a strong connection to family and believe that family members should help each other. Uh, they the obligation though seems to be less in the case of a blended family. Uh, and of course the 85 and over research confirmed that family can be a major source of help when needed. And I would say for advisors uh, where, where family is a big issue and it's a blended family, it seems that there are a lot of issues and I don't know uh, how what all the skills are to get into that, but there should be opportunity to help people sort out some of that. Uh, right. Millennials face greater challenges than all the groups before them. And all of the generations seem to agree that the millennials had greater challenges. Uh, we think that part of the issue there is that uh, the millennials, many of them reached the job market just at the time of the Great Recession and college costs have gone up so much and they have big student loans. So I'd, I'd like to switch, Bob, now sure. from the By general means. findings to retirement. Should we talk about retirement a little sure. bit? Sure. By all means. Uh, so again, looking at this across the generations, among a number of savings and financial priorities, savings for retirement was the second highest priority after being able to afford everyday bills. 60% uh, of respondents said that their saving for retirement was their highest or high priority compared to 69% who said being able to afford everyday bills was their highest or high priority. And I would say this is a lesson in there really for advisors that where you have somebody that's not able to manage on a day to week to week, pay day to pay day basis, well, uh, the first thing is really trying to help them get on track in terms of period to period money management. Uh, the importance of saving for retirement was shared again across 60 to 70 percent of the younger generations and some of us were expecting that maybe the younger generations wouldn't be thinking about that but they said they were mm. uh, the respondents reported behavior that showed a strong interest in retirement savings most who had a plan with a match saved for retirement about three quarters of the employed respondents said their employer offered a 401k and about three quarters of those employers offered a match. So of the people that said they, they could have a match, 83% said they contributed enough to qualify for the maximum match. Mm -hmm. And if that's, if they're telling us the truth, I think that's a really optimistic, good result. But for the advisors that are working with employers, uh, we'd like to see more of them offer those plans for the match. Um, very few of the respondents felt knowledgeable about investments. Hello, this is another opportunity for the advisors. <laughs> right. Uh, when asked to rank themselves between investment pros and investment novices, all, most, the majority chose to rank themselves closer to investment novice. Hmm. Uh, and this was across all generations, not this just is a, this, this is across all generations. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And this, oh, and this should also be a group that would be across all income levels in the survey. And of course, one of the things we haven't really talked about here is that there are, there's other research that shows people tend to be overconfident about a lot of things. So, right. Yeah. You know, of the total respondents, 26% uh, about a quarter said they think ahead 10 years or more when planning, but half, 52%, think. 12 months ahead or less. So this is a, you know, th we talked about this in connection with retirees. 
Right. This is a huge issue, I think, for advisors to help people deal with. But part of it is that if they can't pay their bills, if they're living paycheck to paycheck, then trying to think ahead more than 12 months is really difficult. So it's it's helping them dig out of that hole. Mm -hmm. uh, the older generations are more likely to think longer term. Uh, and clearly, most of the respondents weren't thinking longer term in their financial planning. About six in 10 say they're on track in planning and saving for retirement. Oh, really? Yeah, that's uh, interesting, right? If if most aren't thinking long term, but then they say that right. they're on track, right? So I think for, our, for, for advisors, there's the opportunity there for people who say that they're on track. Well, what do they mean? And if I gave you these three or four measures, would you measure up against these measures? So there's probably quite a few, there's people out there that think everything is fine, but they're forgetting a bunch of stuff and that's an opportunity for people to help them. Uh, at the median, the respondents did not indicate any expectation that retirement ages will increase in the future. And a, a quarter of the millennials said they don't know when they expect to retire. Something that concerns me and some of the other actuaries and people that I talk with is that as lifespans are increasing, periods of retirement are getting longer. And as a society, we really need to be thinking about how to deal effectively with this. So um, uh, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about some of the uh, other differences and similarities between the generations that uh, or have we I do. I do. Yeah. I do. And I want to remind people that this survey um, is available on Society of Actuaries website. Oh, and I just want to mention that in connection with the generation survey, there's a full report of the survey, and then there's there are several reports on more specific issues. But here are big thing differences and similarities, some key similarities. Paying bills is a key financial priority across the generations. And the percentage, though, who are having problems managing paycheck to paycheck varies by generation. Uh, as we just mentioned, um, they're about three and five say they're about they think they're on track to a financially secure retirement. We're dubious. Most of the respondents across all the generations agreed that adult children should help their parents financially and with regular tracks, uh, regular tasks. All recognize the importance of fa family responsibility. I would say that our other research and experiences that there's a lot of adult children helping their parents, particularly when they need help later in life with tasks, uh, not so many probably financially. Mm. Do you believe parents should help adult children if it means it will harm their own financial future? But reality might go otherwise for some people. Right. All of the generations believe that the millennials had it harder than the other groups, the groups before them. Uh, individuals in all the generations were more likely to describe themselves as savers, as thrifty, and as investment novices. And we would definitely see the people trying to be thrifty in the research, uh, probably savers, and the investment novices, as, as we talked about before, very interesting. <laughs> about 45%, nearly half, said they felt optimistic when focused on their finances, and all said they were concerned about paying for long-term care. But concern doesn't mean action. And as we mentioned, other research says that relatively few people actually take steps to plan for long-term care costs. So now, oh, and I would say in addition to the issues we focus on there, um, the generations are similar that of the people employed, uh, that many of the employed people don't have access to any financial advice beyond what's provided through their employer and its benefits programs. And I think a, a big question for advisors is how do we, they reach underserved populations? Uh, some of the key differences were the millennials were most likely likely to have a high level of financial fragility. Mm -hmm. The younger generations had shorter financial planning time frames. Uh, debt is a very big issue for some people. The younger generations were most likely to have debt, with Gen Xers most likely to have mortgages, and millennials most likely to have student loan debt. There were big differences in debt patterns by generation. Yeah. The confidence <laughs> in making financial decisions increases with age, no surprise. Uh, older generations were more likely to feel in control and satisfied, and millennials were most likely to say they felt overwhelmed. Late boomers are the most likely to be planners. And this last one is a surprise to me. The retirement concerns were highest with the younger generations. And of course, not covered 
in our study, but underlying this is that the generations are very different with regard to the technologies that they grew up with and the ones they're comfortable with, which for advisors also means there are big differences in the way they could work successfully with the generations. So um, the, the, some other issues that, uh, that you focus on in the study had to do with um... Uh, with with regard to technology right, and and how comfortable or the different generations are with technology no the society of actuaries i mentioned the technology as being related to how people deal with the finances but mm -hmm. the society of actuaries studies don't directly deal with the technology mm -hmm. or at least the, the post-retirement risk work and the work I've been involved with. But as we've tried to unify our work with other work, for example, some of the federal, I believe it's the Federal Reserve System that does work on how many people use uh, mobile banking and how many people use various forms of technology. And that would be the, the resource to look at for that. But you can clearly find from some of that research big differences in how technology is used. Mm. So as you think about, I mean, I, I can't even count how many research reports you've released uh, in the years that I've known you and that you've been affiliated with the, the uh, Retirement Risk Committee. But uh, are, are there some common themes or bits of advice that we can give advisors about these the findings from your research and some things? Obviously, we touched on some of these things, like maybe helping clients figure out how to pay their bills and create an emergency fund and take advantage of matching in the 401k, learn a little bit more about investing and trying to help them think longer term versus short term, but do you have some sort of, uh, I don't know, well, best actually, tips? <laughs> yeah, actually, I would say, first of all, that I'm really very pleased the extent to which the research from different studies reinforces each other, uh, and there are some common themes. Um, I think one very interesting uh, thing for advisors and people that are thinking about planning it, and some themes that we found in, that raise some really good questions. Uh, the typical person, I believe that if, if they were designing planning software and thinking about the theory of planning, they're thinking about a certain paradigm going forward, uh, maintain standard of living and so forth, and a lot of risk management. Uh, and I'd say a, a theme is that when we ask people about managing their money, their biggest risk management strategy is reduce expenses. And people seem quite resilient and willing to reduce expenses quite a lot. And what surprised us quite a bit from some of the, the focus groups is that they seem quite satisfied with the reduced level of expenses, which, which really raises questions about what adequate is. But going along with that is this notion that uh, when you ask them about spending down their assets and this enormous amount that's been done by us and by other people to help people spending down their assets, often when people say, well, what I really want to do with my assets is hold on to them and then they withdraw the required minimum distributions. And sometimes they don't even necessarily think about withdrawing that amount of money as taking money out of their assets because it's required, which seemed a little bit odd. But uh, the reality is that um, there's this pattern about I'll reduce spending, I'll try to hold on to my assets, and I'll deal with things, with difficult things when they happen. Uh, that caused us a lot of angst when we first heard it with the recent retirees. But then we heard a similar story with the 15 year and over group and explored the shocks and found out, well, it works sometimes and it doesn't work sometimes. Um, and the 85 and over, again, it's, it's kind of the same story throughout retirement. I would say a big message is that uh, as you think about the planning, the where the people are and where the theory has been, there's a gap in thinking about how how do we reconcile that and make that work is a very big issue. Um, so that that would be to me a, a very big thing to think about. And we are we're we're thinking about this question of, of paradigms. I'd also say the whole question of risk management and risk management products. Uh, there are a variety of financial products. There's a whole variety, wide variety of annuity products. There are a wide variety of long-term care products. There's reverse mortgage products. There's supplemental health insurance to Medicare. Uh, when we ask people about their views about financial products, uh, they pretty there's a wide 
use of Medicare supplements, and they all want to buy, or most people want, a lot of people want to buy medical insurance to get really basically full coverage. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the other risk-related products, uh, there's not a lot of support for most of those products when in the drug, they don't, they don't show up highly popular and so forth. And that's a really interesting question is why are people not more concerned about risk management and what's the role in getting people to focus on risk and think about it now and it's it's in it, people behave inconsistently as well uh for example uh people buy fire insurance in their houses right and when they buy fire insurance in their houses i've never heard anyone say and i wouldn't expect to hear anyone say well you know i bought fire insurance on in my house and the house didn't burn down i didn't get anything back i guess the insurance company ripped me off right. you just don't hear that they understand it's insurance um but the whole getting understanding more about insurance and when insurance is a good thing and having a broader perspective on that i think there's a there's a real lack on the part of people about understanding risks and thinking about well when do i really need to protect and how should i protect about risks um i think this question of i'll deal with it i'll deal with it when it happens we've heard quite a bit of that and the question of when is that a good response when is that not such a good response and how to how to deal with that there's a real opportunity there uh, so be I before you go on just a, a quick uh, um, point to make which is advisors um especially those maybe who have focused on investment management versus say financial planning, uh, they may not be um, uh, knowledgeable perhaps to address these risks and the tools that one could use to manage or mitigate or uh, these risks. And uh, and I, I, as just as a side note, the retirement management analyst designation does address as part of its education, uh, some of these, many of these risks that clients might face in retirement. And so I think, you know, there's, there's work to be done in terms of helping advisors learn about helping their clients address these risks that they maybe heretofore didn't have to deal with or think about. Well, I think that's exactly right. I'd also suggest, and this is not, this is not a finding of, of Society of Actuaries Research, but something I've been thinking about. Out. Uh, with the gr growth of robo advisors and different use of technology in the whole investment advising business, uh, advisors that have worked for many years and primarily working with investments, uh, do they have to think about the question of, well, do I need to expand the scope of the issues that I'm dealing with and, and what, what are we going to deal with and how? And I think they're probably also business model questions about how I get paid for it. Uh, another theme that has come up a lot that I think raises real questions for advisors is the whole question about retirement ages, uh, working in retirement. What do we mean by retirement? Do I try to lay a track for phase retirement? Do I try to take steps earlier in life so that uh, if I have a job disruption, I can deal with that successfully? Uh, the being able to work longer uh, is for a lot of people is really an important issue, and it's not easy. And our research shows that people have expectations of working longer than a lot of people actually are. Uh, and I think there's there's definitely some opportunities for coaching and helping people, but it's far away from the, some of the traditional work uh, that advisors have done. Uh, so I think that's a, that's another interesting theme and place to go. You know, go. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that at the most recent retirement management forum in Florida, there was a speaker, uh, Larry Jacobson, who has founded a company called uh, Bowie Coaching. And uh, his practice is all about helping people uh, extend their working career, but maybe move from their primary career into the thing that it is that they always wanted to do but never could for one reason or another so he's helping uh, people and now by extension advisors help their clients figure out what to do next in their in their lives after their primary career ends sometimes well, for pay and sometimes not that's great that's great to hear and of course um, I'm uh, Bob I'm 79 and I'm very much of a phase retiree doing things that I really like to do after my uh, long traditional career as an actuary and in uh, benefits consulting. Well, you get to practice what you preach in that regard. Well, I've, I've, it's interesting because I've lived a lot of it. Uh, I have personal stories. Uh, we're very fortunate society of actuaries to have had wonderful volunteers who participate with us in this work. Uh, many of whom are also retired retirement consultants and have diff been doing different things. But uh, we have, besides what we've learned from our client work and our studies, 
we have many personal stories and the personal stories uh, really add to it. Uh, but I'd like to mention one other area that we've touched on in the Society of Actuaries Research, but I think presents some huge and interesting opportunities potentially for advisors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's housing and retirement. And the um, 2017, that was a major topic of the 2017 retirement uh, risk work. And of course, it's intertwined with the long-term care issues. But the reason I say I think it represents a huge opportunity for advisors is that, first of all, housing is the biggest expense for retirees. And for those who need to cut back, it may be important to cut back. At the same time, most people want to stay put. So I think the whole question, can I afford my housing, is a really critical question. But then as we get into this, the situation of we may need some support, should I move to senior housing. Uh, there are a lot of issues surrounding that. I think sometimes that is a wonderful answer for people. Sometimes it's not. I mean, it's very different depending on the situation. And there are big financial issues because some of the senior housing requires a big upfront payment, which is not, not the same as a purchase payment. It's a payment that may be partly recoverable or not when you leave and higher monthly costs. So there, there is a lot of economic issues. There are a lot of risk issues. Uh, if the senior housing can go bankrupt. Uh, it the costs can go up a lot. It may not turn out to be what you want, so you may have, you may want to leave. So I think that's an unex a largely unexplored area that is intertwined with retirement risk, um, where there are big financial and other decisions, and not necessarily well established tracks about what to uh, right. what to do. So I think it's an opportunity. It should be an opportunity area for advisors, that, which is right. why I mentioned it. Yeah, well, it's interesting too because years ago, uh, use the use of reverse mortgage for folks who might have been uh, had a, a house that they wanted to age in place in was something that wasn't discussed but now it's add that to the mix of things uh, uh, that people can talk about in terms of how to manage their biz biggest expense and maybe how to tap into what could be their biggest asset as well right well and I think there there are situations, of course, there are costs involved, but there are situations where uh, using a reverse mortgage can improve uh, can improve the overall financial picture. Absolutely. Right. So, are uh, I, I uh, were there other tips that uh, that you didn't get to that we should before we uh, before we wrap up? Well, I would say uh, not to forget about really not to forget about the post retirement period and remember that an awful lot of the things that you do for people that aren't retired yet in the in the pre-retirement period, things can sort of turn upside down in the post-retirement period. Uh, the way you manage money prior to retirement may not be the same way you should manage it when you're spending down them, uh, when you're spending down. Uh, for people who have to withdraw money for living expenses, you need to think about how to do that. Uh, really important to get people to think longer term. Really important to be very careful about Social Security claiming. I would say a tip is never, ever encourage anybody to claim Social Security until they've evaluated the answers. And uh, really, really important. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really important thing. Uh, retiring too early is a can be a real problem, and uh, helping people to be thoughtful about that, uh, getting them to think about the rest of their lives. For couples, a tip that I didn't talk about, but I think it's very important, is that it's really important to think about a plan that'll work for the couple, but also for each one of the two people in the couple if they're separated, because eventually it's going to be one and not two. Uh, another thing is focusing on what are all of the different decisions that need to be made and when. Some you have a long time frame for it, some not. Uh, some get made with really not even thinking about them. The Society of Actuaries has a series of decision briefs to help through many of those decisions at or near retirement. And uh, don't forget you're likely to need help later in life. Those are a few, uh, a few of my tips. Mm. Uh, a lot of it's kind of basic, but it's often forgotten. Right. And uh, and uh, two things. If you could just remind our listeners where they can go to view all this research and the decision briefs and the focus group uh, reports, et cetera. There's uh, uh, SOA. The, the Society of Actuaries website would be www.soa.org. And then if they search for, go to research and aging and retirement, and all of these reports will be found under 
your aging and retirement in research. But there is, a, and there's a really good tip I want to give people about that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a series of right now five, but it will be six shortly reports that summarize the uh, post-retirement risk work by issue. And those reports give you a concise uh, coverage that tells you here's the major things that we've covered on this particular topic. And for example, one is on women and post-retirement, uh, one is on the risk, one is on shocks. Uh, they summarize the major findings from the surveys, but also they point to a variety of other resources. So there are a quick guide to this is a particular issue. Here's what we've got on this issue. One covers the 85 and over work. Uh, so I would go to those reports as well. And they're all in the aging and retirement section of the Society of Actuaries uh, website. And I can, we can send links if people want links. They can contact Steve Siegel, S. Siegel, uh, and his name is on the website with questions mm -hmm. uh, if they have them. And uh, Bob, if uh, if you want, we can also send links. Great. And I, I should also uh, mention too that you'll be writing an article uh, for an upcoming issue of the Investments and in Wealth Monitor to be published this summer, I believe in May or June, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'll be actually doing two. Uh, one on uh, retirement risks, covering a lot of the stuff we've talked about today, and the second one on phased retirement and working right. longer. And then the last thing I'll mention, because you're so heavily involved with the Investments in Wealth Institute, is that uh, as part of your duties and serving on the editorial advisory board for the Retirement Management Journal, you have also been a frequent contributor to our uh, to our issues and and in the most recent one published in uh, November, December, you had a book review published uh, in that in that journal. Yes, and I'm working on another one for next year, Bob. <laughs> That's right. Well, Anna, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I'm certain that our uh, listeners will benefit a great deal from not only listening to this, but also go visiting the SOA website to read all the research that's there. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Hopefully you'll come back on uh, in the not too distant future and we'll have another chat like this about different subjects. Thank you, Bob. Been a pleasure, Anna. Thank you again. My guest was Anna Rappaport, chair of the Society of Actuaries Committee on Post-Retirement Needs and Risk. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcasts to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. The Investments and Wealth Institute has been helping investment and wealth management professionals become exceptional advisors for over 34 years. Please visit our website at investmentsandwealth.org to learn more about our certifications, conferences, online learning, and continuing education programs.